So, Dr. O'Hara. Thanks, welcome back. When we all begin, we have to start somewhere, and we each begin with one child. And I just want to tell you very briefly how I got here. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I was a regular card-carrying pediatrician. Uh, and uh, it was actually some parents in my practice. I had lots of kids with autism in my practice, and one in particular was severely allergic to milk. Now, I didn't know that had anything to do with his autism. He was three and a half, couldn't say a word, and stimming out the, the yin-yang. But uh, thankfully, at that time, he got a diarrheal illness and asked one of the nurses in the office what they should do, and the, she told the mom to please take him off dairy because that was exacerbating her di his diarrhea. She did, and he started talking for the first time. She called me, and we discussed all the reasons why that could be going on, like she was doing more therapy with him and had taken some time off of work, and we talked about all of those reasons, and thankfully she didn't listen to a word I said. Um, and she put him back on dairy, and he stopped talking. And she did that three or four times, and then she found Maureen McDonald. And Maureen uh, helped uh, Blake uh, to recover. And this doesn't happen to all our kids. This is a remarkable story, but it's certainly a story of a little boy that got me started on a path that has forever changed my life. And hopefully the things that we'll talk about will continue to change all of our lives. So one of the things that Sid taught me many years ago was follow those who seek the truth, but flee from those who have found it. We don't have all the answers to autism. We don't have all the answers to what makes our kids sick, but we are looking. And that's what you are doing, and we applaud you for doing that. So I've told you about the one child that got me started, and that's where we all need to start with one child. And we look at patterns in that child. We look at patterns. First of all, all of our kids have a genetic predisposition. There may be family history of gastrointestinal diseases, autoimmune diseases, thyroiditis, diabetes. Uh, there are single nucleotide polymorphisms. You may have heard of them, the SNPs, the little pieces of genes that may be abnormal in our kids. But then there is increased susceptibility. From these genetic predispositions, these kids then are more susceptible to the environmental triggers that they may come in contact with prenatally, postnatally, and in the genetic, I mean, neurologically vulnerable period of time of the first couple years of life. They all have neurologic problems, altered sensitivities. We know this. They're sensitive to textures of food. They're sensitive to sounds. They're sensitive to repetitive noises, to crowds, to people. They have abnormal processing, auditory processing, visual processing. But the same thing is going on in other systems in their body, in their immune system, that same altered sensitivity. We know that many of our children have decreased levels of secretory IgA, have abnormal decreased levels of natural killer cell function. They have abnormal processing, autoantibodies, antibodies to brain proteins, antibodies to their thyroid, shifts in T cell with skewing from Th1 to Th2, and as we know now, problems with T regulatory cells. They have problems, as we've heard this morning over and over, digestive abnormalities, and you'll see these again and again, altered enzyme functions, changes in bowel flora, increased permeability, and inflammation. You'll see that over and over again. You'll see the same things that we talked about this morning, this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow. But it's to bring it home to each of you because we can't forget about the basics. And all of the big things that we do have to start with the foundation. And if you're not doing the foundation stuff, the big stuff isn't going to work either. And they all have biochemical peculiarities of some sort. Impaired detoxification. And I'm going to show you my sort of... Uh, uh, more simplistic version of a lot of the, the tables you've been looking at. Many of them have oxidative stress. This is a key factor in most of our kids. Mitochondrial defects. You've heard about this lately because of what's been in the press about the, the case, uh, the court case. But most of our children have problems with the mitochondria, the energy cells of the their bodies. We're not calling it mitochondrial disease. That's not what they have. That's a very small percentage. But they have problems in their mitochondria that we need to look at and hopefully to correct. And metabolic dysfunction. So Liz said this this morning. Sid's taught all of us well. We keep saying it again and again. What does each child need to get and what does each child need to get rid of? 
So what can I as a parent do? So this is the cycle you're going to see 10 different ways, 50 different times this weekend. And let's just take it very simplistically. If you start at the top with methionine, that's an amino acid. And what you're trying to get do, do is get down to the bottom, to glutathione. Glutathione is the mother load molecule of our body. It's the molecule that is necessary for so many functions. Think about you as a mom. You multitask, you do 10 different things at once. Well, that's glutathione. One of the most important things glutathione does is it helps to detoxify our body. So if you look at good glutathione, the GSH, or reduced glutathione, it sort of looks like this with a sulfur molecule sticking out. And, and sulfur is sticky. Like when you cut a piece of garlic, it sticks. Well, think of glutathione as sticking to those toxins you want to get out of the body. And it's detoxifying our bodies. Well, our kids, through research by Jill James, Dick Deeth, and others, what we know is that at least 75% of them do not have enough reduced glutathione, but have increased level of oxidized glutathione, what's shown there as GSSG. So think about it as the two sulfur molecules sticking together. If they're sticking together, they can't stick to anything else. It's going to be ineffective. So that's the, the nuts and bolts of where we're trying to get to. And a lot of the things that we're doing are just trying to make this pathway work better. When we talk about B12 and folinic acid or tetrahydrofolate and TMG, we're talking about helping this part, the folation or remethylation part of the pathway. When we talk about giving um, cofactors like P5P and magnesium, we're using them to help this pathway work better. Think about a car. Most of our cars work fine on regular gasoline, but there are some of our cars that need the high octane stuff to not have the knocks and pings. Our kids need the high octane stuff. That's what we're talking about with these good diets. That's what we're talking about with the nutrients and supplements. It's putting the high octane gasoline into them to make this transulfuration part and the whole pathway work better. Okay. So you've heard it before, I'm going to say it again. We need exercise and activity to help our bowels work better, to help decrease the sensitivities of our kids, and we need to make basic nutritional changes. You've heard this. I'm not going to go over each one, but keeping it non-allergenic. Remember, our kids crave that which they're sensitive to. Putting protein in, especially early in the day. It doesn't have to be meats, but some form of protein, whether it be a pea protein powder, or if your child's not sensitive, a rice protein powder. Beans. Use leftovers from the night before for breakfast the next day. Get protein in early in the day. You save your carbs if your child's having um, carbs later in the day. Avoid excitotoxins. MSG is in a lot of our processed foods. It's in a lot of our restaurant foods. Avoiding dyes. Avoiding phenolics and using fermented foods like kefir, as Julie talked about this morning, and good fats. Somebody asked in one of their questions, what are good fats? Your omega-3s are your good fats, your EPA, your DHA, and some omega-6s like GLA. Juicing is a great way to get, get liquids in. Fr fruit juices that are fresh as well as vegetable juices. There's a lot of good nutrients you can put in in that way. And again, I think if you don't think get and get rid of, then think of the three R's. What are the three R's we need to think about? We need to think about what we need to remove, the sugars, the junk. My friend Stu Friedenfeld says there's no such thing as junk food. It's either junk or it's food. So remove the junk. <laughs> remove the germs. We're going to talk a lot in this hour about germs and how we get rid of them. And then Dan in the next hour is going to talk about how we get rid of toxins and detoxify our kids. There's every acronym for every diet out there. I think um, Julie did a very good job of introducing those to you. There's a lot more on that. Tomorrow during the lectures, tonight, you'll hear a lot more about diets if that's what you want to listen to. Um, Replenish, probiotics, enzymes, essential fatty acids. They're named essential fatty acids for a reason. They're essential. Our American diets are very bereft in essential fatty acids. We can't get enough into our diets for our kids, um, especially with the mercury toxicity of the fish today and our fatty fishes that are highest in essential fatty acids. We can get some nuts in, but we also need to think about supplementation.